Hi guys, this is David Negrin, host of the Script Podcast and executive director of the NYC Screenwriters Collective. I'm excited to announce that we've created a Patreon campaign for the script. Patreon is like a Kickstarter, but it allows you to give ongoing pledges every month and receive ongoing rewards. Of course, the Script Podcast will continue to be free, but we're just asking for a little help. So please, check out all our rewards, join our inner circle. Become a patron of The Script Podcast at patreon.com slash the script. So to become an Avenger, are there like trials or an interview? Do me a favor. Can't you just be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? You're the Spider-Man from YouTube. Can you summon an army of spiders? No, Ned, no. Do you know him too? I stole his shield. Can I try the suit on? Badass. And this is the script. The podcast for screenwriters by screenwriters, the deepest story analysis anywhere on the internet. At the script, we believe story moves pages, story moves product, story moves people. I'm your host, David Negrin. Joining me tonight is Alec Pollock. Hello. Hi, Alec. Hi, David. Once again, we're doing the superhero films. That's what you call me for. That's what I call you. <laughs> we're doing Spider-Man Homecoming. Yes, indeed. Directed by John Watts, um, whose previous credits include films call, a film called Clown, a film called Cop Car, and uh, directed some episodes of the Onion News Network. Huh. So this man moved up very quickly. Um, we'll talk about what, uh, you think about the directing on, on this, uh, picture. Uh, but first the other artists, uh, writing credits <laughs> here, um, to six screenwriters, right? Um, three pairs, Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. John Francis Daly, you might know from... Freaks and Geeks. Yes. Uh, one of our favorite characters on Freaks and Geeks, now grown up, um, and yeah. he's a screenwriter. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. He was. Um, uh, let's see. He was Sam. He, he's the character of Sam on Freaks and Geeks. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, then, uh, the Chris, John Watts and Christopher Ford, who are also credited as screenwriters, the director and a partner of his, and then Chris McKenna. And Eric Somers, also a writing team on this. Um, Chris McKenna was a producer on Community. Um, he wrote on Lego Batman. And uh, so he's a name that I know. So when normally you get six... Oh, so wait, it doesn't stop there, right? Because <laughs> um, it's based on the Marvel comic book by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Right. Uh, and it's and characters created because Captain America is in the film also. Characters created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Right. Right. So um, usually when you have uh, six screenwriters on a project, the film ends up very choppy, very um, uh, uh, disjointed. And I'll say that Spider-Man Homecoming was not. It was very smooth. And I'm going to credit the director with that. Because you know several drafts of the script and scenes get added, removed. And um, he probably ended up shooting a lot of it. Um, but in the edit, in the final edit, this film comes out very smooth and very unified. Absolutely. I think it really, really flows. I think it feels like it was intentional all the way through it. Nothing that was kind of a throwaway or nothing that was uh, put there to please uh, a studio, even if that may be the case. It didn't feel that way, mm -hmm. which again, because you've got two studios involved, there's a lot going on. Who are the scenes. studios involved here? Well, again, uh, we're, we, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into kind of the legacy of Spider-Man and the legacy of the Spider-Man movies, but uh, Sony has held the reins on Spider-Man for many, many years now, um, and it is only after the lackluster showing of the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies that uh, Sony realized that Marvel kind of knew what they were doing. Marvel Studios, Disney's 
uh, studio knew what they were doing with the Marvel properties. And finally, finally, as all the fans and, and moviegoers uh, wish, Spider-Man was uh, enabled and allowed to we, enter the Marvel We want universe. Spidey in the MCU. We want Spidey in the MCU, and we got that. But again, the big question was, okay, the deal has been made, but what's that going to mean for the storytelling? Will Sony actually allow Disney and Marvel to tell the stories the way that they have realized stories work in the MCU? And it sounds, it seems like, yes, they, they, they did uh, you know, let go of the reins and uh, take their distribution side of things uh, uh, for their own. Do you feel like this is more authentic, a Spider-Man, uh, uh, Spider-Man movie for comic book lovers of Spider-Man? Absolutely. 100%. Okay. And, and it, my, my only hesitation was because when the first Spider-Man movie came out, when the mm-hmm. Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie came out, it set new standards for what a, a, what a good comic book movie could be. Okay. So I don't want to discount what it did for its time. Yeah. I think we're just gone into a whole new But in comparison, now. you're saying... So can, can we talk about... You know, let's talk about the three iterations of Spider-Man. Let's talk about the iterating of comic book stories in general. Um... You know, I've seen the Tobey Maguire's, I've seen the Andrew Garfield's, and now I've seen the uh, Tom Holland. Can you, as a as our comic book aficionado, can you maybe articulate um, the three iterations of Spider Man um, under these uh, uh, main uh, these actors? Sure, um, and I think even just as a moviegoer, although largely. You know, tempered and colored by being a, Spider- a Spider-Man and a, and a comic book fan, the first set of movies, those those first movies with Tobey Maguire, the thing that I really take away from it, more so than any of the, the specific pieces of the storytelling, was the feeling of, I, I watched that and I could feel what it would be like to swing through the towers of New York City on spider webs, like, just like Spider-Man. Like it was the first in the time comic books, it. you see it, but you don't feel it the way you do in cinema. Yeah, but but again, the illustrations in the comics always represented that. Like if you had to like have the the absolute, you can only have one image of Spider Man. What is it? It's swinging through the buildings of New York City. Like yeah. that's what it is. Mm-hmm. He's a New York City character, absolutely one hundred percent. And swinging through the buildings is is part of what what makes him who he is, and. We got that feeling in that first movie, which we yeah. never had before. And that was a testament to the technology, being able to represent that on film in a way that was never possible before. Right. And that was great for its time. It was 2002, right? We were talking yes, about Yes, 2002. And uh, we just had X-Men uh, on screen in 2000. 2000. So yeah. that was, it was this new age of superhero movies where we had a lot more uh, um, photorealistic um, CGI coming to bear on the screen. And that was just so. The who, superheroes could be super. They could actually yeah. have powers yeah. and suspend our disbelief. Absolutely. So then, so so you're saying the Tobey Maguire's broke ground. They broke ground and they represented this really as campy as they are. Sure. In and retrospect, look, they weren't as campy as the uh, Batman movies that had just come before it. Oh right. So the the uh, Batman and Robin. Yeah. There was um, a sincerity to it. Yeah. Um, you know, again, one of the other iconic things from that is the upside down kiss with Mary Jane. With uh, absolutely. So so I mean that that there was there was heart to it. There were these. Special There's an homage moments. to that in Homecoming, right? Yes. There's a moment where he's like, upside ah, down, and, yeah, and you're like, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, even that, I mean, if you remember that scene, there's that kind of kiss, it's raining, and then he kind of like zips away, and what does she do? She like, she laughs, and mm-hmm. she like gets really excited, and like, she's like, she can't contain her excitement for what just happened. That's what those movies were. They were, they were, they were exciting. And that's also why the first two worked really well, and the mm-hmm. third lost that. It lost that feeling. It's it's uh, fun lovingness sort of. All I remember is the Sandman being interesting, but not not super compelling. Yeah, and I think that the uh, when when uh, when when Peter went rogue in that one and kind of like oh Venom, Venom's in there a little Venom's bit too. Yeah, yeah. It, it just it just the tone of it lost that that jubilant. It, it was um it was uh it was like in. Uh, is it Superman three where he becomes a jerk? He gets like drunk and like oh. 
is, is that which like Superman is it? I Where Chris Chris Reeve is like like be, turns into an dark. asshole? Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I don't know. You know, it, it, it worked for the time okay. for that age of, of movies. So then the Garfields, the, Garfields. the Andrew Garfields. The, so so I, what I remember was that Tobey Maguire's Spider Man's had covered a lot of ground. You know, and how do you ask for someone's money again so quickly for the same kind of thing? And I remember that the the Andrew Garfield Spider Man's had to reinvent. Um, uh, they just had to be really tight. I remember the jokes were funny, the scripts were tight. It, it just moved quicker. Um, uh, they weren't using the same iconic villains, but. Um, it felt more youthful, like, I, I, I don't know, how would you describe... It felt more youthful, the Andrew Garfield? The Garfields, yeah. Really? To me, yeah. I don't know, for me it just felt much darker, and Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker was this, like, cool type guy, and it just... It, I, it, he wasn't a geek, right, it okay. It just, I don't know, for me it didn't feel right, it felt, mm-hmm. it felt darker, and it didn't have the, the spirit of what Spider-Man you know, represents to me. They redid just, the origin, though, in, in the Garfields, right? Yeah, because yeah. they, they kind of played in with, like, it, the, the parents being kind of, like, involved in some uh, uh, secret experiments and being a part of what created Spider-Man. And again, parts of that was drawn from some comic book stories that thought about that, and some people know that as part of the, 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 the Spider-Man origin. But again, for me, it wasn't the classic Spider-Man. It didn't quite, it didn't quite feel like... Uh, it carried forward the things that are part of the Spider-Man legend. But the, for for Tom Holland, we didn't do the origin again. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. For and Homecoming, you know, the previous two iterations, they do the origin, and now we're skipping it. We just don't need to. We don't... <laughs> again, we have talked about this on this podcast before. Yeah. We are in an age that we don't... A superhero story doesn't necessarily mean an origin story, the origin right. of a hero. It's just the adventures of, the stories of these characters, and what kind of story do you want to tell? And you know, for a fan like me and for you, that's great. But I actually went with a woman who wasn't a superhero fan, and she, we left, and she's like, I don't understand how he got his powers. <laughs> but she's been programmed. <laughs> she's been programmed. She's like, I don't understand how he got his powers. Like, like she's been programmed to, 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 to need that. Yeah. You know, to, to need yeah. That, that part of it. Yeah. Um, I, I went with my wife who does not normally like going to superhero movies, and she really enjoyed this, this new movie with Tom Hall, the new the, the Homecoming movie. Yeah. Uh, I went with my whole family. My six-year-old went as well, and she yeah. really enjoyed it, and she thought that it was exciting. I think Tom Holland brings back balance. He brings back the youth to the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think part of what happened in the Tobey Maguire story is they needed to tell a very complete story. So there's a part of that Tobey Maguire story that fast-forwards, if you remember. It's like... He, you have the origin, and then it's like, you fast forward like yeah. through all of these adventures, and he's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, and all of these things are happening, and it's just like, uh, okay, that that was that was a whole like years and years and years worth of stories that were just kind of like skipping yeah. right by, and now we're getting that. So on the Homecoming, um, it took me a while. It took me till the end of the movie to realize what the title was about. Um, ex- I mean, it's, there's definitely the double, triple meanings to Homecoming. We talk about that. Um, I'll let you get into that. Sure. But um, this, uh, the thing that strikes me from a screenwriting perspective that is innovative, there's a lot of things in this that are just a comic book movie. and But then the thing that's innovative about this is the genre bend. This is a high school coming of age movie absolutely it's a textbook coming of age movie. slash superhero movie okay so it it is like a john hughes film it is like uh the the 90s version of john hughes is like uh can't hardly wait or uh 10 things i hate about you stuff like that it is a high school coming of age film wrapped in a marvel superhero movie yeah and in that way, it returned to, uh, and it's so um, fitting that John Favreau and um, and 
Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. are in this Spider-Man because it's their Iron Man that kicked off the MCU. But Iron Man, the original, it's a very small film. It is not Avengers, right? Yeah, of course. It's yeah. not Avengers Age of Ultron. No, it's a small movie. Some a couple of action set pieces. It's a very character driven piece, and so is Spider Man Homecoming. This is not a huge epic um, scope of a of a of a uh, superhero movie. No, it's a personal story. It's yeah. absolutely a personal story, and as I said, it's a textbook coming of age story where you have someone who has to find their place in the world and has to find their pace in the world has to find where they fit in with the others of their kind in this case the superheroes and in a way that's a way to do origin without doing origin right because we don't talk about how he got his powers but we are going back to a kid in high school who doesn't fit in who's trying to fit in right and that is the origin story of every superhero is you have these powers, but you're afraid to use them because you don't know what your place in the world is. So it's a way to do origin without yeah. doing origin. But again, it's also appropriate to do a coming-of-age story with Spider-Man very specifically, and a coming-of-age story that's a teenage coming-of-age story, because that is true to the character. It's true to the roots of the character. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you try well, to do something similar I mean, with is Spider-Man um, trapped... In, as a teenage boy, is he all is he ageless? He's not, but he gets his powers and he becomes the superhero when he's in high school. Yeah, that's unique, and it's unique again from when Spider Man came out in nineteen sixty two. At that point, you'd had twenty years or so of Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman mm -hmm. and these heroes that were gods and, and adults. And adults, very specifically, yeah. they were adults. I mean, yeah, you had stories of Superboy. And right, and who's reading all these? It's kids, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so, so this, this was part of the genius yeah. of yeah. Stan Lee and Ditko and and the Marvel bullpen, the Marvel crowd, yeah. to say, how can we tell stories that are not about gods on high, but people, humans, high school kids, a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was that humanity, I think, that really differentiated Marvel right from the beginning, from DC in its origins where you had the uh, Tales of Spider-Man in high school. You had the stories of the Fantastic Four, who were a family more than anything else. Right, and right. It was about family dynamics. You had the X-Men, which was a story about a school and what happens at that school for these weird people. So down to earth. And it had yeah. to do with the racial tensions, of the, the real racial tensions that people were facing, especially in the 60s. In the 60s. Yeah. That's what Marvel was dealing with. DC was dealing with these so, heroes okay, and Okay, so that's great. While you're doing the superhero... Um, uh, the the subtext, um, as, uh, you know, Superman was the original immigrant, right? The immigrant story. Um, who who's where's Spider Man? What is his? What is the allegory of Spider Man? Is there a deep like um, uh, Siri knows? Arrival. <laughs> My series. <laughs> A series are talking to each other. So, um, back to my question. Um, is there an allegory for Spider-Man underneath uh, in the comic books? Um, again, it's the saying that we all hear of, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, is always the, you know, the lesson learned and it, the resonance that keeps coming. But again, it, it has to do with that coming of age and understanding what power you are achieving, what power you have in your hands and what you're going to do with it. I mean, I you know, personally always um, come back to my father telling me that you know, when I was learning to drive, mm -hmm. he's like, always remember that when you get into the car, you're suddenly you know, behind you know, the controls of a 2,000-pound weapon. Like, that's always what wow, he had said to yeah, me. Yeah, okay. That's what this is the story of. It's Which like is very it. appropriately a teenage... It's completely um, a teenage ...allegory. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then also... Um, interesting. Okay. So, Homecoming is the Homecoming in terms of the Homecoming dance at the end of the film. It's, it's so many things. It's, it's, the whole thing starts off with him coming home from his first adventure with the Avengers. That's true, it's right, right, right. And, and they, won't, they won't let him back in. And they right? won't let him back in. 
so he's coming home from that. The homecoming dance is this this thing that he's you know uh, uh, looking forward to and that the characters are planning throughout the entire thing. Right. And then again, spoiler alert that you know in the ending, like when he has the opportunity to go and leave home, he doesn't. Right. It, he comes the, back home. in the in the finale. Uh, he's tested by us ask, being asked to join the Avengers tested. for real <laughs> quote unquote tested and uh, chooses uh, to remain a teenager friendly neighborhood Spider-Man yeah. there's the allegory right kids growing up too fast yeah maybe yeah being asked absolutely. to take on responsibilities uh, you know children of divorce or children of single parent families oh there he is yes he is. <laughs> that's what it is he's uh, uh, he's a uh, you know he's an orphan. He's living with his um, aunt. aunt, and he. Um, the allegory there, I'm sure, is like he grows up too quick because he lost his parents, and the this the. The moral is try to stay a kid as long as you can. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding that responsibility. They actually did not under that phrase in this movie, which is also good. With great power coming. They didn't utter they it, didn't so utter yeah. But, but it's implied. It's 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 underscoring the whole thing. Um, let's talk. Uh, when we do superhero tent poles, you know, how did they do in terms of the action set pieces? Because that okay, so usually I have like these five criteria. When we look at a tent pole, you know, the ratio of action set pieces to story was there enough story versus set pieces? Um, then. Is there a character development of all the characters, or do they leave people out? Um, is uh... I found something I <laughs> about this Sure. Our third member of the podcast today is, is Siri, dueling Siri. Siri, Siri, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm gonna have to turn you off. Um, <laughs> all of our series are going off. This is like uh, Karen in in. <laughs> In Spider-Man: Homecoming, right? We've we, we've turned on like full full uh, battle mode, right? The yes, kill eyes. Yes, what were they yes. called? The death eyes. Yeah, yeah. death mode. Or death yeah. mode, right? Yeah. Um. So let me just do them one by one. Um. One at a time. One at a time. Ratio of action set pieces to story. How thought, they do? I thought they did great. My big problem with it was we saw almost every single action set piece in the trailers. Okay, yeah. I like, it's, it's, a, it's still a, a tentpole movie. Yeah, yeah they gotta sell it. They gotta sell it. I know. Yeah. I like. What, I'm sorry to not watch any trailers in order to like really have the full effect. Like, I guess that's it's a challenge, right? Like the, the the best one for me is the Staten Island Ferry one, right? Which was all over the trailer. It's yeah. all over the trailer because it yeah. says New York yeah. and it says it has Iron Man in it and yeah. it has uh, Spider Man in yeah. it. Yeah, um, but. There was so much good story in so this, much good story. you know the 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 fitting in high school, his buddy, right, uh, his love interest, um, and even Michelle, who's like the badass chick in the distance, awesome. who ends up being MJ yeah, yeah. at the end, right, yeah. and his relationship with Tony, like throughout the whole thing, right, yeah. right, definitely one of the main. How did you ones. feel about that? The they kind of shoehorned in the Avengers connect into this film. Tony Stark and Iron Man didn't need to be in this movie. I don't know. I mean, again... Like you, could take, him, you could take him out. Having him be the mentor... Um, I, again, I loved, I loved the ending. Like, I loved that they had that ending in, like, where Tony wanted him to announce that he was going to become a new, the newest member of the Avengers in a press conference like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Again. The way Tony announced, exactly. I am it, Iron Man. Exactly. It's a complete right. throwback to, well, you're going to do it the way that I did it. and Because I'm a showboat. Yeah. Because I'm a showboat and because much as he wants to, you know, diverge from his father, he's very much his his father's son. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, that's a part of his storyline and so it makes sense that he kind of takes him under his wing and he wants him to do just as he did. It's also an echo in the comic books to the Civil War storyline in the comic books where the the, the Captain America movie came from yeah. where Tony does that and he has Peter come and do it's a press a, conference. It's a great line about... Uh, Hannibal Burris has about three lines in this movie and one of them is like, all right, listen to Captain America even though I'm pretty sure he's a war criminal right yeah, now. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was great. It was this great. is a great it way great. to handle the reality but of also, the Civil War. Again... This story itself was built on 
the the what the the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe has built so far. All of it from the very very beginning. It starts off with the Battle of New York and all of the technology needing to be cleaned up after that battle. That's how it all starts. So that Vulture a, is completely tied into all. What of that. a great tie-in, right? Yeah. Um, the Vulture. While you're, uh, I'm, I don't want to get away. L- l- let's hold on the Vulture. Sure. Did they shoehorn in the Avengers into this movie? Did it feel natural enough? I, I felt I felt it did. You, you don't... I, I just feel like the desire for Spider-Man to join the Avengers, like, let me be grown up, that's great. That worked. Problem is, every time Iron Man shows up, it takes away the jeopardy for Spider-Man. And when he saves him, and I'll be honest, once he saved him in uh, in in uh, the first time, uh, when the suit shows up and saves Spider Man from the the uh, the weapons, mm-hmm. right? I no longer. I just kept waiting for Iron Man to keep showing up every time Spider Man was but in that's trouble. Specifically, why they had the sequence where they they hack into the suit and they take out the tracking device so that he can't follow. Yeah, but I, Iron Man is, is like um, omniscient, man. Like like so I. So you didn't buy it that he didn't know I'm where he was. Just sitting that in the seat watching the movie the first time, I was n- never afraid for Spider Man because as soon as I. He, I never felt like Iron Man was far enough away. No one... Okay, you could okay, have okay. even had a character be like, you know, you could have had his buddy say, wait, you're going after Vulture now on your own? We can't. We lost Iron Man's phone number. There's no one to save you. If they just paid a little bit of lip service well, to that. What's the jeopardy for a teenager? The jeopardy for a teenager is not personal um, injury. Teenagers are immortal, right? It's rejection. It's screwing up. Yeah, but it's a superhero movie. I but need, they, I need, they, I need they, Jeopardy for, for you know, in terms of death. But if you had a, a normal teenager, screwing up is going to mean you know denting the car or something. You know, screwing up for Spider Man means that his actions result in the Staten Island ferry being cut, and out. maybe the deaths of other, you yeah. know, of other people. Yeah, right. It's like okay. I thought that they really established everything that happened in the first half of the movie. Everything wrong that happened was Peter's fault. Yes, but I I but by the time Iron Man starts showing up and helping, all I see is Iron Man's not paying attention very well to the vulture and and his arms dealing. It's not even the, the vulture, the whole Washington Monument thing. That was Peter's fault. How how was it his fault? If he hadn't taken that radioactive little egg thing and right. turned it over oh, and his to buddy, the his buddy took he gave him Ned and put it in his backpack. He right. didn't know what he was dealing with. It right. was Peter's fault. The weapon and the fairy. Like he didn't know what he was dealing with. And and Volter says that that to him. Tomb says that to him. Kid, yeah. you're dealing with things that you don't understand. And him like a teenager says Which is yes, the same me- like, it's the same message Tony is sending him. It's like yeah. You can't, you know, being an Avenger is actually like a bigger yeah. deal. But all of these people telling him this again and again, that's not how he learns. I'm just... He okay. learns over the course of the movie, and that's I'm that's I'm not disagreeing part. with that being built in. What I am disagreeing with is the execution of the presence of Iron Man and his taking away from the danger that I felt uh, Spider-Man was in. And by the third act... I, I, I knew only by convention that he would have to save himself. That Iron Man wouldn't be able to show up for the third act. Cinematically, re- well represented by him spending the whole third act in the goofy uniform that he made himself. Right. That helped. Yeah, to say that he was on his own. Yeah, that helped me feel like he was on his own. But, but you for, still felt For about that, like... the, the second half of the second act, you know, I just kept waiting for Iron Man to show up. The thing is, again, maybe it's a it's a... Maybe it's a comic book thing because you you got you know dozens of different stories going on in comics all the time, and it's it's it, you always ask that question. Well, you know, like why why is any of these bad things happen? Why are any of these bad things happening to any of these people? Why aren't the heavy hitters doing something about it? Right. Especially when you got a Tony Stark with bots all over the place. Why aren't they? And there's a little lip service paid to that with Happy saying, you know, they're busy doing stuff. Bigger stuff, which is always the explanation in comic books at, at large. You know, why isn't mm-hmm. Superman re- rescuing every kitty cat 
or is the Flash? Doing, yeah, you know, you know, taking care of every criminal, right. you know, and think because he's got the time, you know, certainly, yeah, you know, like, yeah. If you go too far with that, and so I guess it's, it's and so it's, that is the danger of allowing Iron Man to show up in the movie at all. Is that you're saying, well, he showed up a couple of times. He's mentoring. He's got suits. All this business. If he has time to show up at all, if if he, it, you know. None of the other Avengers are in this film, and so I'm not wondering why Thor doesn't show up. I'm not wondering why, um, uh, uh, I guess Captain America shows up in those, those, <laughs> in those right. hilarious But for uh, you, it's, it's there. PSAs. It's, it's tickling you. Well, it's yeah, you know, his like... presence is like, well, it could, it could happen, you know? Um, had they left, I mean, you're not, I mean, part of... I also felt that there was a marketing need for them to throw Iron Man, arguably the most popular right. Marvel character, into the Spider-Man third reboot to make sure it was a success. Right, right. Well, I think that's what it's all about now, though, the cross-pollination. I mean, yeah. Thor Ragnarok is, you know, a Thor and Hulk buddy movie, basically. Yeah, which and sounds great. You know, uh, Infinity, Avengers Infinity, we're going to see Doctor Strange and but Spider-Man But this was not a two-hander. It's not a two-hander necessarily, but I think like you—they've all got to be enmeshed in some way, shape, or form. I love the integration at the beginning, and I love the integration <laughs> at the end. But that's enough for you. But then Iron Man showing up in the middle, though I love seeing Iron Man and Robert Downey Jr. all the time. I'll go see every Iron Man movie. Yeah. It took away from some of the Jeopardy. I won't harp on that. I wanted you got you were touching on before we get to Vulture because I want to talk about the bad guy. Earlier, you were talking about we were we were talking about the three um, iterations of mm. the Spider-Man mm. films. Mm. Um, you mentioned to me earlier you were t- you wanted to talk about which I think is fascinating um, is how comic books reboot themselves all the time. All the time. Well, tell me about the nature of that it, in the story in, and what is the effect on the storytelling when you have to from time to time reboot. This, the 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 universe and and you don't have to cast new actors right right but, but you have new artists all the time even more even more than when you have reboots of the the universes of the worlds you have new artists and new creative teams and writers coming in mm-hmm. to start telling new stories and to have different takes on the the characters you have sometimes entirely new universes and new, new reboots in mm-hmm. you know in, in 50, the biggest disruption years. in a comic book is when there's a new suit a new suit, sure, right? Sure, that's sure. the new biggest design. disruption. Yeah. yeah, but look, you have to if you're going to have these books persevere over time because yeah. you can't have the same stories being told for 50, 75 years in the same way. Otherwise, we'd have like 1960s Spider-Man, yeah. you know, geeky glasses with the all white kids yeah. in high school, and and this goes into Charles Dickens' range or even you know massively serialized storytelling. Sure. What are the challenges when, when, if you were, you know, can you talk a little bit about how comic books deal with the rejuvenating of characters over a long period of time? Yeah, they, they deal with it very literally in terms of rejuvenation, in terms of saying, okay, we've told these stories, this, this was very big in the 80s when um, uh, DC had done this after their big Crisis on Infinite Earths event where they realized things were just getting too big and too complicated and they kind of like wiped the slate clean and started from scratch with everyone. All their heroes became much younger and earlier on in their careers. So one day you open the comic book and the characters are teenagers. Yeah, and instead of Superman being, you know, landing in, you know, 1940, he landed in 1980 or 1985 or you know, they they, they need to So move they did forward. the origin. They did this with Iron Man where originally Iron Man, you know, uh, had his armor, I believe it was in the Korean War. And mm-hmm. they had to change that, and you know the modern Iron Man, it, much like in the movies, was in Desert Storm mm-hmm. or in Iraq, and okay. you know they, they have to update the time frame of when these things happen so that you just you have a much more modern sensibility of when it's all happening. But you know we we, we were saying how the Andrew Garfields weren't successful in this uh, rebooting because the tone wasn't true to the nature of the character itself, Got it. and sometimes you can play with tone and shift it. Mm-hmm. Batman has shifted tones. Immeasurably over the years, right. I mean, Batman has shifted from the Dark Knight, who used to, you know, in, in the forties when he used to throw people off buildings and not think about, you know, killing people at mm-hmm. all, to you know the nineteen sixties Adam West, you know, wham pow, can't be can't Batman. be Batman, which 
bled into the comic books, but that gave way to the Denny O'Neill detective uh, resurgence, where in the 80s and the 70s he was much more of the detective and it got much more serious. And then you get into the 90s, the, the 80s and 90s, where you get The Dark Knight, where you get Frank Miller's Frank Miller. version of a very dark future and, and this real darkness Gotham. at the core of Batman's story. So, I mean, there's, there's different tones and different ways you can talk about the story. And that's interesting. That's part of what's exciting about it. That, that's part of so what's the interesting. So the world and the character reboot, but the tones, can, the tones can shift, but they need to stay true. Yeah. to why we like this character. Yeah, to, and if they don't, sometimes they don't. And people try things out that, I mean, that's a, you know, it's, it's almost I mean, think mutation. of a comic book character who got better as they evolved him. They, like, figured it out. Like, he wasn't that popular or she wasn't that popular. Arguably, arguably that happens with a lot of characters. It definitely happened with Iron Man. Iron Man was not a very popular character when okay. he first came out. Okay. But there were different stories told over time. I mean, Tony Stark, the character of Tony Stark, you know, started out as this kind of like wealthy billionaire who kind of did his thing and... and, and um, He was the Marvel Batman. Yeah, but he, he got dark because he's an alcoholic. Yeah. And, like, th- that, and he went down that road really deeply in the comic books and mm-hmm. they, they explored that. That's when he stopped being Iron Man. That's when Rhodes took over, Jim Rhodes took over as being Iron Man because he couldn't because he was a drunk at the time. That's amazing. And, and I mean, those are the stories that they were telling as that character evolved. And that storytelling became part of the canon of what the story of Iron Man, part of the legend of what Iron Man's all about. It had a little bit in Iron Man 2 that showed a little bit. He was at a party drunk as Iron Man. Yeah, and, he was and, drunk on the power more. Yeah, and, uh, so, so that's so interesting. But again, all of this goes back way farther than comics way farther than Dickens mm-hmm. I mean, we, we've talked about this it's, it goes back to you know the oral tradition of storytelling yeah. it goes back to myths and legends and being how told the... and retold and modified and exactly. and improved and improvised all that yeah that's yeah. what this is yeah. these are our legends these are our Hercules these are our and so it wasn't the rebooting that made the Garfield movies not work and the homecoming work it, it it wasn't the, it wasn't the rebooting that was a challenge. It was the way they did it. I, I think so. I, I yeah. mean, I think that you're going to see remakes and you're going to see reboots. And, and people these. will go see them. Yeah. They will, yeah. I mean, Fox is Fox is a mess right now with the yeah. X Men franchise yeah. because they're kind of all over the place. I mean, ostensibly they are rebooting the original. Well, we story loved Logan. Team. If you go back, we yeah. have the see the script podcast Logan. Yeah. We had a great time with that, and that was a total departure it was. From, from the way Fox does movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was focused on story and the story that, that they were telling very, very specifically. And I think, again, if they focus on story and great storytelling, integrated, innovative storytelling, and keep pushing things and keep evolving things, I think we're going to see a lot of good things in the future as these evolve. Um, in a minute, we're going to do structure for Homecoming, but before that, I wanted you to get your feeling on the other tentpole... Uh, requirements um, character development in an ensemble uh, Weeding can do it why can't you so <laughs> this film I wouldn't say has a huge ensemble but there's a lot of characters there's a there's a good handful of characters did they do uh, was everyone in homecoming felt were, were they were they well drawn characters if you will uh. <laughs> Um, I, uh, again, as you said, I don't think it was, it was, uh, dramatically broad. It focused on Peter because it was his story. And I think the supporting cast did what a supporting cast needs to do in terms of revealing of, of the different dimensions of the character. So you had a particular relationship between Peter and Tony, uh, in terms of the mentor and the, the men- mentee. You had a specific relationship between Peter and his, his aunt, May, where he was looking out for her, he was very concerned about her and her safety. She was looking yeah. Out for him. Uh, Marissa Tomei's Aunt May was actually pretty well drawn. Yeah. There's 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 connection enough. She there. She was drawn yeah. enough so that she could fulfill her purpose. Ned, I love Ned. Ned was great. Is love... Ned in the comic books at all? Or again, a little bit of comic book geekery here. Yes. There's the Ultimate Universe of of Marvel Comics, and there is the regular universe of Marvel Comics. The Ultimate Universe was this retelling in a much more modern format Mm -hmm. of a lot of the stories. A lot of the Fantastic Four movies have drawn from the Ultimate Fantastic Four. X-Men have drawn from the Ultimate X-Men. Were those comic books being released in parallel at the same time? Yes. 
the insane, Avengers, insane. The Avengers drew a lot from the Ultimate Avengers, much more so than the mainstream. For example, huh. Nick Fury in the mainstream was a white guy from World War II, and in the Ultimate Universe, it was Samuel Jackson. Yeah. In the comic books, before right. he was in the movies. Right. So, like, a lot was drawn from this Ultimate Universe. And Ned? Peter... Well, I'm getting to Sorry, that. sorry. Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man in the Ultimate Universe, eventually, spoiler alert, dies. And another kid becomes Spider-Man. A 14-year-old kid named Miles Morales becomes Spider-Man. Ah, uh, yes. I a know young this. black Latino kid becomes Spider-Man, and he exists now actually in the mainstream universe. They've brought him over into the main universe. I think the Ultimate Universe is no more, but certain things that... that uh, were good about it carried over. Ned was Miles Morales's best friend. This, ah, this character, okay. um, I'm not sure if, if he had the same name, but this character was Miles Morales's the best friend. The actor, his name is Jacob Batalon. He did an incredible job. So good. Of comic relief and empathy and... The guy in the chair! He was the guy, guy in the chair! <laughs> like, how awesome is that? Because it's, such a, it's, it's a commentary on a trope that we expect. It was so and meta you know, and so well done because it pays off later when he helps him and he's like, guy in the chair! Guy in the chair! <laughs> guy in the chair! He was so good. He was really good. But again, he existed to be a reflection of Peter in terms of certain concerns that he had about like oh my god isn't this amazing what am i doing he asks a lot of the questions that we would ask mm -hmm. if we were in that position so is he well drawn as a you know multi-dimensional character i don't know but no he works for his great role mechanism in the story. Yeah. yeah yeah um there okay so that's let's do and then overall originality of a superhero movie plot is it more than the supervillain army comes to take over the world? Is it more than an origin story about accepting your new powers? Again, you and I have tied this conversation before where the superhero movie, as is kind of defined by Save the Cat yeah. and, and that superhero genre, it, it bases itself on the origin. And I think we've gone past that. We've yeah, gone we're past that. the origin. That superheroes is a, is a genre like westerns or space where you can this, tell lots but of this plot stories. is different this plot is i've been demoted to the minor leagues and i'm not happy about it i'm yeah. playing double a ball and um i want more yeah. and that's interesting and at the same time um i'm not getting the girl at school that i want right yeah. um so it's down to earth it's a different plot than uh your classic origin story yeah. And um, now let's let's talk about Vulture. The vu the villain is has actual we actually get backstory in our villain here. Yeah. And interesting allegory there. Yeah. And backstory that's tapped into this world. Talk about world building a lot. Yeah. Right? Sure. This is tapped into this world. You have a world where alien technology and Stark level technology has infiltrated the world. It's all it's out there. It's like a virus in and of itself infecting the world what does that do to a world yes and what kind of characters can come of that i like it i like that that tombs is, is a working class guy yeah. who is he does uh salvage uh very similar to like construction work and he's a foreman he's a total blue collar guy and in the beginning of the film which is eight years before homecoming really gets going these uh uh white collar government Ty liberal types step in and say we're taking your jobs right great sort of allegory for the end of manufacturing in america right yeah for the challenge of the the, the class of of workers who've done manufacturing for so long and he he actually slugs one of the guys which is what every guy who you know ever worked at a car manufacturing factory or in a coal mine wants to do to the white collar yeah. guy who cuts his wages or lays him off, right? Yeah. Um, and Toombs has this commentary that, I don't know, he keeps talking about, I'm doing it for my family, we're doing all this stuff for my family. Um, and he essentially he turns into a arms dealer. He deals alien arms. Yeah. Asking the complicated question, like, how far would you go for your family? Like, what would you do for your family? Mm-hmm. He has a pretty nice house by the time they throw the yeah. party there, though. Yeah. 
is he's not necessarily uh, just scraping by. <laughs> just scraping by. He's not, he, you know, he's not Breaking Bad level where you know he's dying of cancer and he right. needs the money. Right. So no, he's he's. We don't he's, get that much color behind Vulture behind yeah. Tombs. He's still a bad guy. He's yeah. still about. He's still a little bit of a um, super villain yeah. archetype yeah. in that sense. Yeah, enough, but interesting. And again, it's Michael Keaton who is amazing. <laughs> like. Well, how do you... How, yeah, Michael Keaton's wonderful in this. You can watch him do anything, right? You can watch him read the phone book. But um, he does a great job of making the vulture a nuanced bad guy. He's not super evil in this. No. And no. so when... He the, even talks about like laying low. like Don't attract the attention of Iron Man, of all these others. He's just mm-hmm. like, let's do our thing, run our business, we're good. Like, yeah. Don't reach too high, don't fly too high. You know, don't... don't yeah. Is um, the guy with the the, the hammer Shock, uh, shocker? The, shocker. The, the shark. Is he yeah. a, is he a character from the shocker? Is definitely a, a, a classic Spider-Man villain. Okay, um, and I think several people have taken on that identity. Okay, so I think the two guys who use this, you know, there's, yeah, it was there's a little shocker. confusing that one guy had it and then it transferred over to the other guy. I don't think you needed that in this film. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think it was homage to what happens in the comics where there are two different shockers over time. But did we really need it? No, did not we need this in the movie? No. no. Actually, what I really needed, so the the Michael Keaton villain turning out to be the love interest's dad. At first, I'm shocked, at, and then I'm, like, loving it, because it's, it is it is so perfectly the high school movie trope that you end up, you know, at odds with the father of the love interest yeah, in the totally, high school movie, right? Totally a trope. And again, think about it as compared to uh, the, uh, they, they, they pulled the same thing in one of the earlier... Uh, Spider-Man movies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, several. I think where yeah. we, where you had uh, the cop being the dad uh, of, of one of them. So it, it's a thing that Green Goblin do. is the dad of of, uh, of Harry. Of yeah. Harry. Yeah. yeah. So, but but in terms of this being like one of those John Hughes coming of age high school movies, the dad going head to head with the dad is a great uh, a plot twist. It's a great plot twist. And they, they, it wasn't just a twist and throw away. Mm-hmm. Those moments from when you reveal that up until the fight, when he when he runs out and puts on his like crappy costume, like that that span of, of filmmaking, how dramatic and amazing was that? Just in terms of well, the conversation it's very in the car. interesting you, because you have that tension. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the car, we don't even know if this guy he's he pulls out his gun and he's like you know. Um, I, uh, Tom Holland Spider Man did something where he he uh, he saved his the he daughter saved Liz in the, in the from Monument, from yeah. from the Washington Monument, and so the guy because he Tombs is a fair guy, he has like working class values. He's like, all right, you saved my daughter, I'm not gonna kill you now, now, <laughs> right? But stay away from my business. Yeah. And then in turn of fair play, you know, Spider Man tries to save Tombs at the end. When he's messing with technology that he shouldn't be, right? Isn't yeah. that how it ends? Yeah, I mean, he's he's yeah messing with all this technology. He's trying to fly away with it. Peter realizes that they're going to explode. Yeah, and he he goes in and rescues him, and uh, and that again he doesn't reveal his identity to Scorpion at the end in the post credit scene. So interesting enough. So the thing I wanted to say about. Uh, Michael Keaton's Vulture is that he gives it and he's written to have uh, more of a heart like he is an interesting other character in this film yeah definitely and we care about what's going on with him he's not a one dimensional villain um, and he has a code you know he's a little bit of an anti villain you could say um, it's interesting because he's the diametric opposite I guess of Iron Man and so you have these those two Forces. He's the opposite of Iron Man in what way? He's a scavenger instead of an inventor. He's, you know... Blue collar instead of a super rich. Cow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. He's like, he represents, you know, again, he talks about it. He has that, that he's, he has that moment of... Work. They're both arms dealers. They're both arms dealers. But he says to, to Peter, he's like, you know, you and I are not different. You know, you belong with me. You right. belong with me. They you don't that, belong with Iron Man. Yeah, you belong yeah. with me. So it, it, it's, again classic argument of like going back between these two poles of this which don't world forget you where you're from 
Right. That's Which another world homecoming. Do you belong in? Re- exactly. Revelation. Exactly. You know, when it was, it was very interesting to me that when uh, Tom Holland's Spider Man, when Peter Parker is like uh, pretending he has to speak, in, he changes his voice to have like a real New Yorker accent, like a working <laughs> class New Yorker accent, right? It's actually more like a Bronx accent than it is a Queens accent. Yeah. But uh, who's to say? So, um, well, two New Yorkers on this podcast, that's what you used to say, right? By the way, just a quick sidebar, because we haven't mentioned this, and again, it's one of my favorite things about this entire movie, is that this is the most Queens Spider-Man movie ever. This movie was a love letter to Queens. Yeah. And so many, I mean, again, I'm a native from Queens, so seeing that... What were, what were your, what was the, what were the landmarks for you? Again, his relationship with the deli owner, like going into the deli and just like being that, the, 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 the the crazy authentic multicultural diversity of the story at yeah. large like I know that, that that that's on a much bigger bigger issue but it also has to do with Queens the, the most diverse borough one of the most diverse places on earth full of immigrants full, full of immigrants of, you know it's totally part of diverse that. yeah and um, then the, you know even the the idea of um, uh, 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 you know the, the the subway kind of working through it the um, the Ramones music being played throughout the whole like it, all of it just just made me feel like they got it. They got this. And then the fact that like the school that he goes to is a specialized high school, a New York City specialized high school for you know smart kids like him. Yeah, makes complete sense. Like, of course, that's where Peter would go. He wouldn't yeah. go to like the average school where he's going to be tormented by jocks. He's going to be tormented by a bully. But the bullies on the academic Olympics. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, They're it, both smarter. Yeah. Right. It just it felt it felt so right. And, and um, I wanted to say I want to, a couple of things before we get to. Well, maybe we should just do structure because we're running out of time. But, sure. Um, I wanted to say that I thought the high school drama part was some of the best stuff of this movie, but I still was a little dissatisfied. I wanted them to take it further. The high school stuff you wanted to take Yes, further. because the film switches back to the superhero stuff. Mm-hmm. And our finale is beating up the superhero and winning. Mm-hmm. The finale is not fitting in at school and getting the girl. Mm-hmm. And so... To me, had they fully committed to this being a bend of these two genres, the finale would also have involved getting the girl and fitting in at school. Well, again, don't forget about the, the actual the ending of the movie. So it's a coda, but the ending of the movie is him rejoining the team for next year, the the academic the Olympics academic team. Olympic team. And suddenly he gets this moment with MJ. Right. Who is revealed. She's the real girl. She's the real love interest. She's the real connection. Yes, and but you know what? There's pl- there's actually um, there is they do use that trope of throughout this film the the beautiful girl. This is exactly this is um, the be- the beautiful girl who you think you like, and then the awesome girl, you know, cool chick who's the one who really likes you, and she's like you know p- secretly pining for Peter this whole time. Right, I don't it's, know, pining, but she yeah, a little she, bit, she right, right, in, in her own yeah, like badass like, way. Yeah, but it's um, it's like those '80s films, like um, pretty uh, some kind of wonderful, some kind of wonderful, yeah, and Pretty in Pink, right? But by the end of those films, he realizes who he's supposed to be with. Yes, right. Yes. Um, you felt that it needed that resolution. I didn't here. get that. I mean, again, it's I wanted, set up I got the resolution two. of the superhero movie sure. for sure. Yeah. And I didn't get their full... I didn't think they took the high school movie to its full end. In fact, I thought the Shocker could have been a high school rival. I thought the Shocker could have been like the jock or even, you know, the the Flash guy they had who was kind of a rival um, if he had been employed by the dad at his plant. Right. And it was a was also a romantic rival for the main character. Right. You know, I thought that would be like okay. So now he actually gets to fight Shocker, win the girl. That would have been good. You I, know, I totally hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And then good. and then you're fighting the dad and fighting the villain. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you you can resolve your superhero bit at the same time you're resolving the high school bit. You would have also had kind of the A story, B story, C story coming together. In the Which is what we like as screenwriters. Which is what we like. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And there's no way that that was going to happen on Tony Stark's plane. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, true. 
True. I hear. I mean, they they really like had a they lot. They went of pretty far. Yeah. They just I I thought that they could have taken a little further. Yeah. Structure, screenplay structure. Let's just do the basics. Let's talk. Let's work backwards. Let's talk. Um, uh, setup catalyst. Well, we're gonna work forward. Setup catalyst. <laughs> break into two. Uh, setup was really that whole backstory of him working with the Avengers. Very fast rewind. Yeah, um, really setting everything up. You know. And at the same time, you have the parallel of Tombs' story. Yes, actually, that's our more of our our meaty setup is yeah. where did Tombs come from? Yeah. 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 Um, high school. I'm a geek. I really want to be an Avenger. Yeah, like all of that and calling, trying to like do his thing. So that was all set up. But it, what's our catalyst? Is it is it him getting the suit? No, because him getting the suit is still part of the setup. It's part of oh, the, it's the part of the set. Story. It happens in the very yeah. beginning. Okay, so, so what is our? Well, let's talk about what's the break in the two yeah. and what's the catalyst for that break in the two. Catalyst of this story, right, or the catalyst that starts kicking things off, has to do with what leads us to Peter interacting with the the uh, the arms dealer of tombs, right? That's too, that's later on. I, I mean, if you think about the fun and games of this movie, it's uh, you know like the bad guys that he in he beats up in the, the bank. in the bank. That's the it's, thing. That's the catalyst. That's uh, his first experience with the oh with the, the weapons. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what leads to it, right? That's what leads us into the story that this film tells. Okay, so you're saying the setup includes I'm web slinging again and and I'm having fun and I'm. I, he has that montage where he's, he somebody steals a bike and he gets the bike. There's a montage where he um, he stops a guy breaking into a car and the guy's like, "It's my car, right?" And there's a montage where he's like dancing and they're yeah. like, "Dance that's for me, that's friend. all normal world. So that's all normal world. Okay. Right. Then um, he encounters these super weapons at the uh, at the bank, at which turn, which actually this is a really good point end up uh, hurting his friend who runs the sandwich shop. Right. His, right? His, his normal world is threatened. Right. Okay. And now he has to do something about it. And he begins to investigate the these alien weapons in New York City. Right? Yes. Okay. He goes to the party. The party. When he goes to the party is when he then traces, you know, chases the van. And Which is such a great way to bend these two genres. You get to the... This is such a great high school trope. You get to the party. You're finally in. You finally got the invite. The girl is there. And it's then the special world. something yeah. goes wrong yeah. that make, makes you not be able to ask the girl out, yeah. make the move, do anything. Yeah. But so, the thing that goes wrong is... A superhero issue. A superhero issue that yeah. has to go chasing them through this weird world he's not used to web slinging in because there's no buildings to web sling. Oh, that's right. I didn't get to catch and that. Then he's got to have the Ferris Bueller running through the backyards because there's nothing. Oh to my on. God! The homage to the to the running through the backyards and then we cut to Ferris Bueller. One of the greatest Brilliant. moments in coming of age movie history. Yeah. Hi, Brilliant. my Hi. name is Hi. Ferris Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, and uh, yeah, the, the the cut to it. I, you know, I thought even you know sticking with Ferris Bueller, you know, the post credit scene, like Ferris Bueller's post credit scene, is the okay, granddaddy. I'm gonna, of I'm gonna admit, I skipped the post credit screen. In, we, first, in this in this movie <laughs> in Homecoming <laughs> because I we we, we uh, my friend and I ran for the bathroom I uh, ran for the bathroom <laughs> and I knew it would be on the internet anyway I, but you haven't watched it so I haven't watched it Should so tell me it? no please tell me and our audience what's the post credit well, sequence post credit sequence I don't know if you saw the first one the first one was in the prison nope uh, you're in, see in the prison you see Tombs walking down the line in prison and he is kind of walking past another set of inmates and when he's, he passes he passes uh, the guy who was going to do the deal on the Staten Island Ferry the guy from Breaking Bad yes and from uh, uh, Better Call Saul yes um, who has a little scorpion tattoo he's going to be the scorpion in you know, another Spider-Man villain in the future he passes him and the scorpion guy says I hear you I hear you know who he is Spider-Man I hear you know who he is uh... and Tombs said uh, you know you Wait a minute, ten, moment of tension, like, cause he's, we know he knows, and we know he put him there, but we also know that he rescued him. Yeah. And Toombs says, if I did, he'd already be dead. 
Nice. And then they're like, Toombs, your family's here. And he goes to see his family, and that's it. Because he's a family man at family the end man. of the day. Yeah. So that was that. And then credits, credits, credits. You wait all the way till the absolute end. I feel like I shouldn't even tell you this. No, 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 I want to know. I want to know. You wait till the absolute, absolute end, and it's a white screen. And you're like, what the hell is going on? And Captain America comes on from the videos. Right. It's, it's another PSA. Okay. <laughs> and the PSA is about patience. And about waiting. <laughs> and whether it's actually worthwhile to wait for things sometimes. <laughs> again, talking about completely meta and referencing. And that's what I'm saying, you know, again, Ferris Bueller. Lovers, that is that amazing. It, it and was, that's it. It, it, it was, was basically the Captain America version of, why are you still here? Why Go are home. you still like, here? Go home. Yeah. But, but it was all completely in character. He turns off camera at one point and he goes, how many more of these do we have to do? Like, <laughs> it was hilarious and brilliant. So and it was a it was a Ferris Bueller homage, <laughs> and it was a meta uh, Captain America PSA, and it was a meta we know that post credit sequence yeah. thing, and we're making you wait. <laughs> it was bravo, really fun. Like, bravo yeah. to the director, because you know it, it's you know they don't have to do those no, things they well. Do. They don't have. To but do again, them. tone. It was fun. It was fun and part of the whole spirit of the whole thing. Yeah. They got it right. What was our midpoint? Uh, what was our midpoint? Um, I Stakes are raised. Uh, no turning back. Um, the team is split up. The powers don't work as well anymore. Well, again, I, I, really, I think that the whole midpoint area is, is when Tony and... Um, Peter are at odds and Peter disconnects the suit from the Stark network so that he can't right. he's on his him. own yeah. he's on his own and now it's a different story he's in it and all of a sudden he's got the suit that Karen shows up why she's called Karen I have no idea this but the AI great. shows up uh, who's the AI from Iron Man what's the name of the guy who eventually turns oh. into um, Vision yeah, Jarvis Jarvis yeah. okay so I was wondering like oh Karen played by Jennifer Connelly I by know. the way I know which I know. is great from the um, days yeah there's another shoehorning of Iron Man and Avengers stuff into a Spider-Man film but again it's true to the comics because that's what he does in Civil War okay. Tony Stark makes a, the Iron Spider suit for Spider-Man no which kidding. is is like an Iron Manified spider-man wow. suit which is That's cool and it's and it's gold and red and it's the one we see at the end that he doesn't take didn't even push that far enough like it should have looked like an iron man suit made spidery like oh, they really wow. should have pushed it even more to like hammer it home that like before this I, is an iron man before i forget i love that they opened with the spider-man music oh my god Absolutely. thank god for doing that the orchestral version like, yes I, I came out of the theater going like this is like again. It's a modern legend. That's what this is. It's not yeah. like think about it. It's gone from like this like cheesy like t you know children's television cartoon that had this this music this theme music that is now part of our culture to the point that you've got these orchestral uh, compositions of the of the music. So I I, I love that. It was it was great. Uh, very easily, there are all is lost is uh, when the the uh, Staten Island ferry almost. Uh, gets killed everyone almost gets killed on the Staten Island Ferry. Mm -hmm. He's sliced in half mm -hmm. and Tony actually shows up and tells uh Peter that he's not ready to be a superhero and takes his, his suit from him. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think that uh I think it's interesting also that, that they use Tony specifically in that way as almost a, a demarcation of these specific plot points. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where the mentor is coming in and the, guiding you through. There is a moment. screenwriting uh, 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 paradigm where they talk about a main character and a dynamic character where the dynamic character is your mentor and the um, break into two is the dynamic introduction. Um, then act two is the dynamic escalation. And then all is lost is the dynamic estrangement. Which, again... You have and then the third act is dynamic reunification. Right. Which, again, if you want to take, you know, the, you know, the classic Star Wars, you know, you've got Luke and Obi-Wan mm -hmm. following exactly, exactly that, that through those, those four points. Yep. Um, and Peter and Tony do that in this film. Exactly that. They become estranged. And then there's the reunification towards, you know, at the very end, they're back together mm -hmm. and... Um, he, he, they're reunified for real when 
um, Peter is under the rubble and he hears the voice of Tony Stark saying, if you can't do it without the suit, you don't deserve the suit. Yeah, that was his use the force loop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turn yeah. off the targeting camera. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's it. We did structure. We're awesome. Okay. Well, Let's... again, it's a testament to the way that it was so cleanly structured. When I, when I was saying it's a textbook coming of age story, it follows all of these, but these it, structural it, beats. It's it's coming of age, and it's a, a and it's your superhero uh, mystery movie. You know, he's got the villains, he's got to find them. You know, yeah. and it did a great job of juggling those those two genres back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, did you pick up the Washington Monument homage? You were just telling me about uh, the architect of the uh, Williamsburg Bridge Queen, Williams, Williamsburg Bridge being the same as the architect of the Eiffel Tower yes and when I saw the Washington Monument scene I thought of Superman 2 where Superman saves Lois Lane in you know falling elevator in um, at the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, Tower. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I yeah, thought right. this that was a homage to Superman. That's interesting. He absolutely saves uh his friends in the Washington Monument, which is kind of America's Eiffel Tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, but again, 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 so cool because when Superman does it, Superman, you know, swoops in and takes her up and like yeah. know, flies her away. Right. And Spider Man like just barely gets by rescuing the girl and then it looks like he's gonna like die himself when he like falls through. Right, like, right. That's the difference between Marvel and DC. Like in its God's essence in versus just humans dealing with these extraordinary heroes, abilities yeah. and powers and how do you deal with the responsibility of them and the reality of them in normal everyday life? And are they enough? Are they are they good enough? What are they going to do to to actually save the day? That I mean, that's let's make that the final word, man. <laughs> that ap- a- absolutely epic. Thank you. Um, is there anything last you want to say about this movie? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, I think we've we've said a lot. We've said uh, it all. I'm I'm your host, David Negrin. This is thank. I want to thank Alec Pollock for joining me tonight and being our uh, comic book uh, guru. Um, thanks for coming on, Alec. By all means, thank you, David. The script is produced by David Negrin, edited by Zoe Alexander. A uh, reminder that if you like the script podcast, please give us a five star review on iTunes and subscribe to the Script YouTube channel. Join our Facebook page by searching for NYC Screenwriters Collective. Follow us on Twitter at ScriptFeed. You can support The Script Podcast at patreon.com slash thescript.